Thank you guys so much for having me. It's wonderful to meet you, Rich and Matt. So, uh, Nikki, where are you calling in from today? So I live in Wake Forest, North Carolina, uh, for the past seven years with my family. I have two boys and a golden doodle and a wonderful husband. But I can detect an East Coast uh, accent there. So uh, it, are you initially or originally from North Carolina, or, or do we have uh, an East Coast connection with you? So you've got some Jersey in the house. Yeah, I grew up in Bergen County, New Jersey, River Edge to be exact, the Northeast corner, very close to the George Washington Bridge. And then went to college in Philly, in Philly area, Villanova University, lived in Baltimore for a while, and you know, recently picked up a y'all, as I like to say, being in North Carolina for about seven years. So yeah, I've, I've done a bit of moving and I, I could hear your guys Long Island right away. Yeah, no, you, you're, you're never going to uh, mistake in Matt or Rich for anything other than Long Islanders. I love so, it. Um, so the, so in addition to having, um, you know, the rough accents we have on the East Coast, and we're glad you were able to soften your uh, East Coast accent by moving South, uh, but we do have some challenges with uh, growing up in the line belt. So talk to us about what it was like first to grow up in New Jersey and let us know a little bit about what you knew about ticks and tick diseases as a uh, as a gal growing up in uh, the line belt. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting is so the area of New Jersey I grew up in was um, very suburban, you know, it was um, I'll say I never saw a tick, honestly, Rich, like the entire time uh, growing up in Jersey. I really don't think we had a great deal of habitat. And I will tell you my um, general tick acumen, if you will, or awareness was extremely low as a kid. I did go with my family almost every weekend up to the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania to a really rustic um, little home that my dad built that had like no HVAC and like a you know wood burning stove. We did a ton of hiking. We're a very outdoorsy family. We never checked for ticks. We also never found any during childhood, which I thought was interesting. Well, it is interesting because, you know, ticks are really hard to find, right? And uh, they've yeah. evolved so that they can find you and grab you and bite you and and stay attached to you for a long period of time and then leave you without you ever discovering them. But, uh, you know, it would be, quite frankly, impossible for me to believe, especially someone as young as you are, uh, growing up and, and going to school in two of the top three um, Lyme disease states. Uh, you 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 spent time in Pennsylvania in the Poconos as a child, and then you went to college in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the number one state for Lyme disease diagnosis, and of course, New Jersey is number three. Uh, we here in New York are number two. Not that any of us really want to be, uh, you know, any of the top states. So um, it, it's impossible for me to believe that you weren't bitten multiple times. And unfortunately, because uh, there wasn't a lot of Lyme literacy available to you either through the, your educational system or culturally. Uh, to put you in a position where you could find ticks biting you regularly. Yes, you'll have to forgive my chief snuggles officer of my organization here. She barks a little bit. Um, you know, it, it's so true. I've often thought about that. You know, could I have been exposed to Lyme or other tick-borne infections at a younger age and been completely unaware of it? And the answer to that is absolutely yes, because we didn't look for ticks. Um, you know, we weren't really, again, we just weren't aware of it being a problem, but I'll tell you where else I lived that it was really endemic. So my family spent seven years in Connecticut, um, west of Hartford in a very rural area, absolutely beautiful, Burlington, Connecticut. And that is where I definitively was bitten by ticks and other members of my family were bitten by ticks that we were completely aware of. Um, prior to me falling extremely ill, I have a vivid recollection of being in my kitchen and picking up what I thought was a gray watermelon seed off the ground. And I grabbed it and looked at it and it had like legs squirming and it was a fully engorged tick. Now at the time, I assumed that had fallen off my golden doodle. I had a big, big dog and he would go out. But the thing was we had started using, I know it's kind of controversial, but it's a Soresto collar for our dog. Um, I will say living in Connecticut, nothing was more effective at repelling the ticks off the dog. So when I found the super engorged tick, it didn't really add up. I was fearful that it could have bitten one of us because typically with um, dogs wearing, you know, these uh, tick repellents or medications like that, they promptly usually die even before they bite. So yeah, yeah um, that was sort of, yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the Sorresto collar uh, just just for a moment. Um, I have um, I have several companion animals uh, in our home, and we actually use Sorresto collars and. 
Um, you know, most of the challenges that at least our family and friends who, who are also using stress or collars to uh, try to protect themselves and their companion animals from, uh, from ticks and tick diseases, um, find that the smaller dogs have more challenges with stress or collars than larger dogs. And that's not uniformly. I have a friend who has a pit bull and his pit bull had a lot of challenges when he was using the stress or collar. But, you know, we find it to be a very effective tool. And most of us find ourselves, especially if we, you know, we have um, a traditional relationship with our pets. You know, my dogs sit on me, sleep in my bed. I mean, you know, we, yeah. you know, the, we find ticks on us all the time. So, you know, stress or collars are, I, I think, a really powerful tool if it's right for your companion animal. But absolutely, uh, yeah. So we we have another dog now. I mean, we we had our last dog for over twelve years. Um, Till he crossed the Rainbow Bridge, and now we have our Maya here, who's wearing a Soresto. None of my dogs ever got sick from it, um, but I think you know that they they're effective, and so that's why she wears it because it reduces the capability of her to come inside with a tick and have one of us be bitten. So it is really important recognizing that you know there are a number of different places where we can come in contact with ticks. Eighty percent of the people who come in contact with ticks actually come in contact with ticks when they're in their own backyards, and those of us who have companion animals are often going to have ticks brought into the house, and that of course is going to uh, be a challenge that we have to be focusing on, right? So checking regularly, in fact, every single day is something that you have to do. And what we find is people who tick check find ticks. Uh, and for a long time, Matt has teased me on this podcast and called me the tick magnet, but I'm not a tick magnet. I grew up in a place and in, 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 in a culture where we would check every single day. I grew up on Long Island. We were bitten by ticks all the time. I had a very aggressive Italian mother and she made us check every single day before we came into the house. Um, and we had so many ticks, you know, both on our companion animals and on us. We actually had uh, what I call our janky tick kit, where we had a vat of Vaseline and a um, and tweezers and 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 matches, with, so we could pull out the ticks and burn them. Uh, again, that that's not that's not a, a uh, an appropriate type of tick kit. But back in the you know back in the sixties and seventies, um, yeah. that's what we would do, right? So okay, your um, mom was ahead of her time. She your was mom. well. Wow. So, she was she was she was ahead of her time but yeah and and believe it or not we were we were concerned about tick bites in our community before the Lyme bacteria had been at least officially discovered um we we had many many people who were diagnosed with Rocky Mountain spotted fever during my childhood very and that's dangerous. what had us that's what had us all uh you know very concerned um of course many of those people had Lyme disease but it, we didn't know what it was back then so and, you know tick checks were were a regular part of our lives so when Matt is, you know, Matt is calling me the tick magnet all the time. I, you know, I, I argue to him regularly. I'm not a tick magnet. I just check every single day, actually twice a day, because I've done it my entire life. Uh, so I, because it's a, a part of, you know, my regular grooming um, when I when I'm getting on getting dressed for bed, when I'm, you know, when I'm getting up in the morning and going into the shower, tick check is something that we do we do regularly. And uh, clearly, your dog is approving of my uh, of my practice of uh, of of. Um, uh, of tick checks, right? So let's let's talk a little bit about what your vision was for um, how you were going to serve the world when uh, when you were a child and moving into your college years. Yeah, so sorry, I had to, Chief Snuggles officer is gonna go have dinner and <laughs> mark the remainder of the podcast, my apologies. Um, um, so you're asking about, you know, what I had hoped to do with my life, essentially. Yeah, what, what, what were your, I mean, what were you, what were you dreaming about? What were you, what were you hoping for in, in the way that you were going to serve the world? So it's funny in, um, sixth grade, we had in River Edge where I grew up, Roosevelt Elementary School, they asked us for the sixth grade yearbook, which was at the time, that's when you went into middle school. Uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I had had a teacher go out on maternity leave and this amazing teacher take her place who had like, she had been bitten by the science bug. So I had more science with Mrs. LaSaracena than, you know, any other prior year of my schooling in elementary. And it was funny in the yearbook, I said I was going to be a botanist because I really enjoyed learning about, you know, plants and that was something obviously that our new teacher really enjoyed too. So I think that's kind of funny. And I, I kind of go back to that at the earliest stage because I've always been like a really curious person. You know, I was like the little girl out in my yard with like a Tonka truck digging up the onion grass and making like a, you know, taking apart the onion and figuring out, okay, this smells like onions. I don't think it's, just, you know, a, a curiosity. So um, 
I got, um, you know, into high school, absolutely. My favorite subject was biology. I had the most amazing biology teacher. He was a um, PhD high school teacher. And uh, the majority of our class in advanced placement high school biology got like a perfect score, either a four or a five on the AP exam, because this guy was just so good. Doc Milligan, we'll never forget him. So this was sort of very formative for me because I was curious, I loved science, absolutely loved biology. And then I started thinking I would apply for bio programs in college. Um, I ended up actually going to Villanova University and talk about like the serendipity of life, right? So I only applied to three colleges and I, you know, the strongest case that I had to be admitted to a biology program were those AP scores. And at the time they had to be sent by mail from Texas to the college. So I only found out, um, I did not get into the biology program at Villanova University, but I wanted to go there. That was my first choice of school. So I had uh, a distant relative who had majored in science, but then ended up as a business person in a pharmaceutical company and said, you know, you could, you could go for business and then still work in science. You know, you can get a job in pharma and still you know, essentially help people, but not necessarily be a researcher or a physician. I was thinking maybe I would go to med school. So I ended up going to Villanova University um, into their marketing program only to find out that the reason I didn't get into biology was they never got my test scores sent. So I didn't find that out until later when I went to go get my eight credits that I was due from, you know, basically acing the biology AP exam. And they said, we don't have your, we don't have your scores. So that's the first interesting turning point. So I, I studied marketing, I studied French, and I studied international business. And I have to say, I wasn't particularly taken with the business classes. Nothing really was like grabbed me the way science did. But I will say that it, I am so thankful that I went that route and that I actually didn't end up going to medical school like I had thought I might initially do. Because I think working in industry really gave me an economic perspective of things that I would really seriously miss out on um, being that science is the thing I love to read about in medicine. Like I could eat that up all day and every day and I do. Um, but the business stuff for me, I think, you know, really, really helped me more today than if I had gone another route. Well, give us some detail on how, how did the, the business education help you with the work that you're doing now? So when I graduated from college, um, well, first of all, I met my husband that way. Congratulations. At work, and he's a wonderful human being. Um, so I graduated and I went to work straight out of Villanova for Pfizer in pharmaceutical sales. And why that was important and weirdly serendipitous is that I was working in a few different product areas, but one of them was with an antibiotic for super duper drug resistant infections like MRSA, methicillin resistant staph. And that had me working with infectious disease specialists. I also launched a neuroscience product. Um, so I had a chance to work with anti-epileptic drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs. And again, I'm kind of a geek and I loved their training was next to none. Pfizer sends you away. We were away for like six weeks taking tests every day. You had to have at least a 90 on those tests. They basically put you through miniature med school and you take pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Um, so being in industry taught me about the economics, but I also learned a ton about hospitals and about doctors and about the healthcare system at large and how to navigate that system. And also to observe some of its deficiencies, right? Like a general lack of communication and integration to attend infectious disease grand rounds, which I loved doing. And to go beyond the scope of what my drug portfolio was that I was educating on for Pfizer and to really enjoy, you know, learning from the doctors I was working with. So I used to go in with my orthopedic surgeons I called on um, because I had a, a COX-2 inhibitor drugs, those drugs that were actually some of them pulled from the market um, back in they, the early They were causing a lot of heart issues, right, with the COX-2 inhibitors? Yeah, that was very controversial. Um, that What was really not as publicized was that some of the over-the-counter NSAIDs like ibuprofen actually had many of the same issues, if not worse, when they were compared head-to-head. -head. But there was, you know, it was a very unique political landscape at that time, is what I'll say. There were a lot of patients that lost out to the loss of two of those drugs out of three because patients that had a very specific type of drug allergy but also had arthritis um, were left with very little option. So the time in pharma was interesting. Um, 
after Pfizer ended up working for um, a biotechnology company called Genentech, which is just an amazing company with an incredible culture. Um, the way they treat their employees was just stellar. And it was a real gift to be hired by them because I was really underqualified. So in that role, I had 50 hospitals under my purview and I was working in neuroscience um, with their acute ischemic stroke drug, which is the clot buster that you can receive when you go to the hospital if you're having a stroke. Um, and then I also was working with almost every area of the entire hospital because that same drug could be used to open up um, central venous access devices that many Lyme patients end up getting, like pick lines or ports can become clotted. And when that happens, you increase the risk for infection, you increase the risk for emboli, also for having to have surgery to get a new line put in, which is risky. So I was responsible for educating hospitals on how to properly care for those lines. Um, and it was, it was a great experience because I had such a large number of hospitals and such a large portfolio under my purview. Um, but I worked very heavily with neurologists because I was working with stroke. Um, so I think it's, again, incredibly serendipitous as far as my life was concerned for what would happen to me later that I wasn't even aware of at the time. So there are many folks who have had bad experiences with the medical community um, in the Lyme world. And yeah. many of those folks um, have a dim view of the contributions that are made by Big Pharma. What mm -hmm. would your response be to folks who have a dim view on Big Pharma? And what role do you think Big Pharma can play and should play in the Lyme disease uh, challenge? Yeah, it's a, it's a big question. And I've thought, spent a lot of time thinking about it, right? Having worked in that space and now having worked for six and a half years, basically in an advocacy capacity, building research collaborations, realizing that a lot of what's against us in the work we do, which is to unveil the role of chronic infections in diseases like Alzheimer's and asthma, is that economics are working against us. So the anti-infective space is flat out one of the most struggling spaces in the entire industry. And that speaks to antifungal drugs, antibiotics that kill bacteria, antiviral drugs, antiparasitic drugs. Um, these drugs are incredibly important to humanity, but severely undervalued for a variety of reasons. And some of those reasons are the pricing of the drugs. So we don't value them the way we should. So a new company comes out with a new drug, even if it's fantastic, the market only wants to pay maybe a few hundred dollars per dose. And if it has to be dosed twice a day, now you're talking about um, a big amount of cost for a hospital to buy that into their pharmacy and to start really allowing for its use. So it makes it very challenging for doctors to even write new drugs. Then you have the issue of, because of that, the lack of economic incentive for companies to actually develop these anti-infective drugs. Um, so there's been a drastic reduction and there have been, I think on the order now of about 10 bankruptcies in the anti-infective space of companies that came with something so cool, you know, that could really help a ton of people, but they can't continue marketing or promoting it or manufacturing it even because they don't have, they haven't recouped the investment dollars. So the system, that system is broken and there are, thank goodness, really smart people that work on it. I don't know if it's enough. Um, I do think that the, the pharmaceutical industry at large, and I'm speaking very broadly here, has been really focused on rare diseases because those things are extra extraordinarily profitable. Like if, if a drug can get st a special status, it, it comes through the FDA faster. It commands a really high price. The audience for the drug is very small, but pharmaceutical companies know that they can have return on that investment if they come up with something effective and it can help some people. The problem is your really big diseases, like Alzheimer's, for example, where we've still got nothing, basically. Uh, two new drugs were approved targeting the plaques that form in people's brains, the amyloid beta. Um, what a lot of people don't realize that we harp on all the time in my research group is that amyloid beta is a response to infection. So all right. the whole uh, let, let... field you know, has been geared around. So what I'm saying about the industry as a whole is... By and large, when you see drugs on the television at night, we're interfering in pathways in diseases that we don't understand how they get started in the first place. Whether this is drugs for psoriasis or for arthritis or you know, drugs to, for multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, some of these chronic conditions, 
we have a lot of these monoclonal antibody drugs that are intercepting a pathway, which frankly could potentially be induced by something like an infection. So, right. so, so we're looking at the downstream pathways or symptoms, not at the causes. Correct. So our group advocates for root causes. Now, I'm like an eternal optimist. So do I think that the economic challenges we face are insurmountable? They're not. So here's the thing. If companies pivot toward understanding chronic infections, you know, there's a place where a balance can be struck between benefit to humanity and profitability. And it's in understanding that some of the neurologic infections, for example, like let's say, okay, I'm going to pull a page out of another book. Somebody has um, TB, tuberculous meningitis, right? They have, um, that's caused by mycobacterium. It's actually interesting because it's similar to some of the other microbes we study in the sense that it's um, a germ that likes to go inside human cells. It's really hard to kill, just like Lyme. Um, incredibly difficult. So it is known that if somebody has TB meningitis, a central nervous system infection, they need to be treated anywhere on the order of 12, even up to 24 months. And then they still have to be monitored for relapses. They also have to be treated with multiple antibiotics because the TB becomes uh, resistant to any one drug very quickly. So this sort of paradigm of treating chronic neurodegenerative conditions or chronic conditions that affect the bones or skeletal system um, addressing some of these stealth infections is going to require combination approaches. It's going to require long-term therapy. And so somewhere in there, um, Rich, the long-winded answer to your question is that, that companies, once they realize that this is an important issue, there, there could potentially be a huge market for it and a huge upside in terms of benefits for patients. All right. And I'm excited to explore that with you in more detail, but I want to, I want to bring you back to your experiences with Lyme disease uh, so that we can, we can start to build out the parallels between what you experienced on your Lyme disease journey and how that brought you to the place where you are now. So talk to us about, talk to us about um, a little bit more uh, about your experience at Lyme disease. You did share with us that you found it in Gorge Tick uh, at one point during your life. And we didn't build out together um, what happened after that and how you ultimately became chronically ill. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, what's interesting is, so I had Lyme, you know, I had evidence of uh, Lyme disease on my blood work, but I didn't just have Lyme. You know, my story kind of goes back earlier. So um, one of the other issues that I became acutely aware of once I also figured out that I had Lyme disease, what was that people could have chronic respiratory infections too. Um, so I had my whole life, I had asthma and it was really bad. Like when I was young, I remember getting epinephrine at my doctor's office because my airway was closing. And at that point, like she didn't even think we could make it to the hospital. So it's my pediatrician, you know, withdrawing epinephrine out of a glass vial, hitting me with it and then monitoring me. Um, in the office for a long time. And I was a really sick kid. I missed a lot of school. I had chronic respiratory infections, tons of strep and horrible asthma. Um, when asthma drugs came out on the market, uh, I was 18 when, when GlaxoSmithKline's AdBear, the purple disc came out. And that was remarkable. That was a combination of like a long acting uh, dilator to keep the lungs open and a steroid. Um, that kept me good for a number of years, but only come to find out that's sort of a Band-Aid. You know, um, the steroids are masking something else. So the terrible year of my life that took place involved the tick bite. But I do believe wholeheartedly that it also involved infectious agents that I had on board in my body, probably for my whole life. And that it sort of tipped the scales in favor of inflammation all over my body. So basically what happened to me was um, I was in my early 30s. I had little boys. They were three and five years old at the time, my kids. And I went from being like super healthy. Like I, I had run a half marathon. Um, so I was an avid runner. I was always an athlete. Even though I had asthma, I'd carry an inhaler with me and just puff away at that thing and just go. Um, and then I, you know, suddenly uh, the first thing that happened to me was my breathing got out of control. And it was kind of bizarre because I had an asthma and allergy specialist who was like, weird, you've been so good for so long. And I was like a mess. So I got put on um, steroids, prednisone. And instead of getting better, that got worse. And at the same time as this happened, I remember something else weird went on. I mentioned it to the allergy doctor, but he didn't think anything of it. 
my joint in this finger was swollen and painful. And I'm like, kind of weird. I have like an arthritis in this finger. And he's like, nah, I don't know about your finger. Let's just talk about your lungs. So we um, go through iterations with the prednisone till it got to 80 milligrams a day. And what I was suffering with was, yes, it was my asthma, but it was also a new symptom that I couldn't explain. It was so bizarre, but the, I now know that people with tick-borne infections can get it. It was air hunger, hungry for air. And I would lay next to my husband in bed. He'd be sleeping. I'd have the nebulizer hooked up, trying to like, you know, just take breathing treatments, but it wasn't helping because it was like, I wasn't oxygenating. Like my O2 sats were low. Like I was starving for air and I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I mean, so this went on for a period of six months and on the 80 milligrams of prednisone, which I didn't tolerate very long, another really strange thing was happening. I was losing weight. And so people that take steroids typically gain weight, but that was happening. I also developed this weird rattle in my lung and uh, at that point, one of our friends who was a doctor, because I had worked with hospitals, we had a lot of friends that were doctors, an interventional pulmonary doctor friend said, I'm ordering a CT scan of your lungs, even though I'm in another state, I think you might have cancer. So he was just so alarmed by my weight loss and my symptomatology that he thought I could have a tumor in my lungs. So I had a CT scan and they saw diffuse inflammation. They didn't see consolidation like a pneumonia. They didn't see um, any tumors or cancer. And that really got me on like sort of the merry-go-round. So I ended up with two pulmonologists, an asthma and allergy doctor, um, a uh, consult with a cardiologist, because around the same time I was also diagnosed with an arrhythmia. My heart rhythm was off. Um, and it was absolutely terrifying. Finally, my asthma doctor said, because of the inflammation on the CT scan, I'm going to treat you for atypical pneumonia, which is could be caused by a uh, respiratory bacteria called chlamydia pneumoniae or mycoplasma pneumoniae, sometimes rarely Legionella, which is something that you can get in your HVAC system from having a dirty HVAC. And I started thinking about infections. So I came back to the office, like, what about ordering a test for mycoplasma? What about ordering a test for chlamydia pneumoniae, the respiratory bacteria? He just said, let's just put you on a Z pack. So I go on the Z pack, azithromycin, um, and it was miraculous. Within a couple of days, my lungs were like, ah, oh, we're happy. And I'm going, oh my gosh, after like months of this, I'm, I, you know, it was amazing. So we had, I remember we went out and had a bonfire with our neighbors and I stood far away from the fire because of my lungs. But I was like, okay, we're going to do this thing. We got this. I'm going to be okay. Well, I relapsed as soon as it washed out of my system. So that drug stays for 10 days. Repeat that numerous times over. He retreated me. Finally, he got a pulmonologist involved who put me on a 30 day course of azithromycin and steroids. He was insisting on the steroids and I was nervous about that because of what had happened. And after that 30 day stint, my lungs were like stable, I would say. It wasn't good. I had a chronic cough. Um, my breathing was like meh, but I wasn't awake all night like gasping for air. And I'm like, okay, maybe we're through this. And this is the summer. Um, so End of summer comes around, fall sets in in Connecticut, and it's Halloween, and we're getting ready to go trick-or-treating with our little boys in our neighborhood, and suddenly I have like this urgency and pain in my bladder, and I go to the bathroom, and I urinate, and I come back, and I said to my husband, that's weird, because I didn't really have much like in my bladder, but I'm in a lot of pain. I think I have a UTI. So this continues, right? I go to the doctor. They test my urine. They don't find anything. They put me on an antibiotic anyway and send me on my way. And I got a little bit better on the antibiotic, but then it came back. So I went back to the doctor again and she's like, weird, I'm going to send your urine out this time for a culture and I'm putting you on a different antibiotic. Well, that antibiotic helped a bunch, but it was only like five days. So and what then, antibiotics were you on? What was the first antibiotic? Uh, you know what? I wish I was... I was so sick at that point. Like, I don't remember the first antibiotic that was given, but the next one I believe was like a cephalosporin, the second one. And I felt better on that to the point where, you know, like when, when you have bladder pain or cystitis, they recommend not having caffeine, which I'm a coffee fanatic. I have a real problem. Here it is right here, even though it's late in the day. Um, and I go to like, you know, this restaurant to meet my mother and father-in-law with my husband and kids for brunch. And I had a coffee that day because I was on this antibiotic and I was feeling better. I'm like, okay, we're going to be okay. It's a UTI. Well, the culture comes back negative and my doctor drops the literal bomb on me. She says, I think you have something called interstitial cystitis. 
And so in the office, I really don't think, you know, I'm not freaking out yet. And, and I'm like, well, what is it? She's like, well, it's idiopathic and it's autoimmune. And I'm going, because a lot of that was just said to me with regard to my lungs, you know, in the summer leading up to this. And I'm starting to really hate that word. I'm going idiopathic. Okay. But it's inflammatory. What, you know, what could it be caused by? She said, well, there are things that we can do. I'm going to send you to a Euro GYN, a special urology doctor that specializes in chronic pain syndromes, pelvic pain. And they can, you know, maybe prescribe you amitriptyline and I'm going, oh my goodness, like an old anti-epileptic drug. Those are really dirty drugs. Um, and I'm like starting to get kind of upset. Um, I went home and looked it up and I fell apart because it said incurable, largely one of the top 10 most painful things a person can suffer from. And at this point I was feeling like I could go to the bathroom around the clock and I was in a lot of pain and the idea that it would never go away, like frankly, like leveled me. So I spent a number of days crying and, um, sorry. It's so oh, that's okay. That's okay. It, 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 we're sorry to ha ask you to relive this, but it is important for our folks to no, hear. No, I, I know um, other, so other people with Lyme disease get cystitis, they get bladder pain. Um, so you know, I, I read about, the more I read about the disease, at worse it made me feel, you know, that women would keep journals and men would keep journals and they might go to the bathroom 70 times a day. And then I started trying to imagine like doing life that way with little kids, like how it, you're not present when all you can think about is, oh, you're having trouble breathing and now, oh, your bladder is killing you. So um, I ended up at this point, once I picked myself up out of like horrible anxiety, I was like, you know what? No, this doesn't make any sense. This is idiopathic garbage. This, something changed. Something is different. My joint, my lungs, now my bladder. What is causing this inflammation? So I did a Google search. And as I say, it changed the rest of my life. I looked up idi um, atypical pneumonia and interstitial cystitis. And I found a study and I found a person who changed me more in so many amazing and positive ways. And I credit my life, like saving my life to this doctor who published this, this one study that popped up. And it was a small group of women out of Vanderbilt University Medical Center led by Dr. Charles W. Stratton. He was the director of clinical microbiology, an infectious disease specialist and a board certified internist. He had three board certifications. He was a global expert on a weird, stealthy intracellular bacteria called chlamydia pneumoniae. I didn't even know about this bug. I only knew about chlamydia, the sexually transmitted disease. Uh, I didn't know it came in a lung variety. So this study was really fascinating. He did it with a urology colleague. And instead of, you know, typical urinalysis, which relies on cultures, they did PCR. And they also looked at the lining of the, the bladder and they found that 80% of the interstitial cystitis people had intracellular chlamydia pneumoniae. And the conclusion was, this is small, small study, you know, needs to be replicated with a larger study, but the work that had already been done on chlamydia pneumoniae indicated that it was the perfect candidate to set up chronic inflammation. You know, that it steals uh, energy from our cells lives inside ourselves, recruits all sorts of inflammatory cytokines, a word that everybody became aware of during COVID. So I just couldn't believe it. And then I did another search. Oh, and it said this could cause atypical pneumonia. So then I go, I've had asthma my whole life. This is a bacterium that's chronic. And I look up chlamydia pneumonia and asthma and the PubMed, you know, search result was, was enough to stun you. And it was the moment where everything was turned on its head for me the whole concept of autoimmunity, what I had been sold my whole life was with my asthma, that my lungs were simply being attacked by my own immune system, or, you know, that I was responding to these um, particulates in the air, like dust or mold, perhaps. But I come to do reading, and I understand science from my time in industry, because I love science. And I'm noticing that this organism can actually sensitize your lung tissue to things in the environment, meaning it's kind of like pissing off your lungs, and it hangs out there your whole life for some people. And then I wonder, like, could there be a cure for asthma? And I stumble upon Dr. David Hahn's work, who now has been my colleague for six and a half years. He studied uh, infection and asthma and demonstrated that you could actually cure people. If you give them antibiotics, some of the patients that you give them to for a prolonged period of time go into prolonged remission. So um, 
and, and I always have him here next to me. This is, this is Chuck Stratton, the doctor who properly diagnosed me. So I reached out to him because he was the corresponding author on the study. And I didn't think he would write me back. I literally wrote uh, my entire story of everything that had been happening to me, including the bladder. And I'm going, okay, this is like, he's going to think I'm, you know, not okay sending all this pri private information via email. But Dr. Stratton got back to me in five minutes. And he said, it, he wasn't a man of many words via email, but he said, there's a blood test. You should be tested for chlamydia pneumonia, IgG and IgM and IgE. And so the rest is history because from there forward, I asked him if we could have a call. I talked to him about his life's work. So apart from studying the role of this bacteria in the bladder dis disease, he studied it heavily in regards to multiple sclerosis, which at that moment when I first met him wasn't relevant yet. Um, but he also was uh, one of the people that suggested, in addition to a good friend in Connecticut, who is a physician, that we look for Lyme. So in conjunction with my primary care doctor, who is my age, by the way, and extremely disturbed by my deteriorating health, she had a phone consultation with Dr. Stratton, which qualified as an ID consult. And based on my lab work um, for multiple different chronic bacterial infections, including Borrelia burgdorferi, they, she initiated antibiotic therapy for me under his guidance. And she was willing to treat me for a period of three months which Dr. Stratton on the phone had warned me was probably going to be completely inadequate. Um, so, and actually, so I'm jumping forward a bit. You'll have to forgive me, like, cause this whole thing is emotional and it happened like dominoes falling. There was a period of time during my bladder pain diagnosis between my bladder pain diagnosis and getting started on long-term antibiotic therapy, because Initially, when the prospect of long-term antibiotics was proposed to me, I didn't like the idea. Like Why? many of us, I had worked in infectious diseases, mind you, and gone to infectious diseases grand rounds. And I promoted a product for Pfizer that was for drug-resistant infections. So I worked with microbiology labs and knew all about MIC drift and the issues that we were facing as a society of, you know, drugs not working as well anymore. And I was scared of side effects. I was scared of developing C. diff you know, or some other um, terrible adverse event. And at that point, um, I implemented a lot of like holistic approaches. So I started eating raw garlic for the bladder pain. I was pretty smelly. Um, I started drinking smoothies with fresh ginger. Did you do that too? <laughs> yes. In fact, did you ever have the effect where it's coming out of your skin and your pores and you don't smell it, but nobody wants to be around you? Because that happened to me a lot. So yeah, oh, yeah. No, I was, I was stinking it up. Um, yes. One doctor told me to give up dairy and meat. So I went vegan for a while and I didn't get any better. In fact, I think it got a little sicker because I didn't supplement B12. Um, and I was hungry all the time, hangry. Um, so I, um, I had a period of time where I took like a very holistic approach, like after I talked to Dr. Stratton and it wasn't until, so that's that October I developed the bladder pain disorder. I went all the way to June. I developed neurodegenerative symptoms. So I had been increasingly tired, right? Really tired. I went to the doctor and my doctor was like, well, you're a mom. Like, you know, yeah, we're all tired, you know, join the club. But this is like not normal tired. This is like tired where you could fall asleep at the wheel driving a preschool in the morning after you just woke up. Then I started having, um, one morning I woke up with like terrible numbness and tingling, arm, leg, tingling, muscle spasms, muscle fasciculations, things moving on their own. You know, the eyelid twitching by itself. One of my fingers moving by itself. And then this Nikki, horrible... you, you were you taking antibiotics at that time? No, I was not. So I kind of like jumped forward because I forgot about like the in-between period when I first met Dr. Stratton and I found the bladder uh, and, you know, chlamydia pneumonia, I link, did all of my holistic stuff, which by the way, did help my bladder a great deal. The weird garlic, ginger, come to find out, obviously those are highly antimicrobial compounds. They kill germs. They're ancient medicine essentially. And I was pounding that stuff, blueberries, you know, um, integrating exercise as much as I could tolerate it. Um, but the neurodegenerative symptoms were frightening. So the other thing that happened during that time with the numbness, tingling, brain fog, I was noticing my memory. I was noticing a weird thing where I'm a very emotional person, but I had trouble crying. 
Like it was like, I couldn't cry. Like my affect was different. And then I noticed, um, this was just like, you couldn't even function. I was having this intermittent stabbing behind my left eye, like a hot poker. Like somebody had heated up like a sharp metal object and was just driving it through the back of my eyeball. I went into the primary care doctor again, um, again, and I, I kind of skipped forward. She ended up treating me, but this was all a part of the litany, right? She'd seen the breathing thing come up, the joint, the um, bladder pain disorder. She knew about all the holistic stuff I was doing. And I came in with the neuro stuff and she said, I'm worried that you could have MS, you know, based on everything I described to her with my symptoms. So we waited for a neurology appointment. And I'll never forget it because I went to a neurologist in the state of Connecticut in Hartford where Lyme disease gets its name. And this guy, literally, I brought up Lyme disease and he said, well, I don't know about Lyme. Um, yeah. That was his answer. And so he did an exam. He said, I'm not seeing anything too remarkable, but the brain MRI will tell us a lot. So he ordered a brain MRI and I, you know, described the feeling of waiting in the machine, you know, like with the magnets banging, like wondering what the technician is seeing on the other side, you know, do I have lesions all over my brain? Am I going to get it progressive? debilitate and and not get to watch my kids grow up so um I got the news that there were no lesions um a number of days later but by that time I had almost kind of already let go and decided like I think your body can only handle so much anxiety and I think like a flip switch where it was like okay well if I have that diagnosis I'm gonna just keep going like what other choice do I have it's gonna be okay it has to be okay I have to find a way so I didn't feel super relieved when I didn't have lesions either, because when I met with the neurologist, he said, you know, a lot of people are like you, they simmer and brew for like a decade and then boom, they have lesions later, but there's this prodromal symptom phase, you know, that people go through. So it wasn't exactly like you can't rule it out. Right. I didn't have a spinal tap at the time, lumbar puncture, um, to look for any oligoclonal bands or anything like that. But I reached out to Dr. Stratton again, who, as I said earlier, had done research on chlamydia pneumoniae and multiple sclerosis. And I told him about my symptoms progressing. We got on the phone and this is the point at which he called my primary care doctor and they arranged a discussion. And that's when I started antibiotics um, because I feared for my life. So I didn't want to use the antibiotics uh, because I had preconceived notions and, and actually many of them were false, I might say, um, as well, but I started with a cocktail of, um, uh, rifampin 300 milligrams twice a day. And he started me on azithromycin 250 milligrams Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which was well-documented in the asthma literature. Um, so Dr. Stratton ended up becoming, so he was my doctor. He became my mentor. Um, for a period of years and he became like family to me. So um, at certain point he said, you know, Nikki, my family calls me Chuck. So would you just call me Chuck? So Chuck, um, you know, was compassionate down to earth. He heard his patients. He listened, you know, like he warned me about what might happen with a Herx reaction. You know, he's going to start me on these antibiotics. Look, you've got Lyme, you've got chlamydia pneumonia. And by the way, I was privy to something through Chuck, which was amazing. He had my blood sent to an academic lab that could do direct detection for chlamydia pneumonia. And I indeed had active and live chlamydia pneumonia. The test that was done is called reverse transcriptase PCR of a blood product called a Buffy coat, which is like after blood has been spun down, there's this thin layer. Um, that was done by one of the leading chlamydiologists in the entire world. He actually ran the test on my behalf. And I made a donation to his lab just because I was so thankful um, to have an answer, you know? And um, yeah. so pretty soon after starting this cocktail, my asthma went into remission. I'd had it my entire life and I'm going, oh my goodness. So I'm writing Chuck an email and I'm saying, I went off the inhalers. I went off the Zyrtec and the Singular and all this stuff that I've been taking for decades. And he said, I'm not surprised. And um, I did end up getting sicker at a point before I got better. Um, he did try me on a very powerful rifamycin antibiotic called rifabutin. And that landed me in bed for six weeks. Um, okay. 
So Nikki, let me let me walk some of this back um, because you you've brought up so many different things that I, that uh, Matt and I are going to want to discuss with you. But let's let's I want to I want to ask you first of all for your definition of Lyme disease. Um. So maybe you can clarify. Do you mean how do yeah, I? So how, how do you how, did... how do you define Lyme disease? I've argued on this podcast uh, hundreds of times that Lyme disease is a disease without a definition. Right, that there are so many different definitions for Lyme disease that um, that uh, we we as a community have to take control of it. And Matt and I are trying to do that. And I'm going to give you our definition in a minute. But I want to ask you, what is your definition of Lyme disease? Well, what definition were were you largely given through the folks who were helping you to be diagnosed with Lyme? You know, so I go back to Chuck, and you know, he's so he passed away. It'll be two years ago in March. So I have I'm to sorry. have him on my desk here, and I. Uh, think about him every day. There's a million things I want to call and ask him. And I, I, you know, I, I know that he's with, with me still to this day, even just in my heart and soul with the, the way that he, you know, helped me and then mentored me. Lyme disease is a chronic infection. So okay. the, the first problem that we have to address as a medical community is persistence because I, you know, again, I spend my time in the medical literature every day. There is ample precedent that we are not clearing certain infectious agents from our bodies and that those infectious agents directly lead to pathways that promote chronic inflammation. So if you ask me, I actually prefer to call it Borrelia burgdorferi infection, um, you know, or prefer to call the infections by their name because unfortunately, and I have said this and I don't know if this is popular opinion, but I believe it to be true, there are a lot of people who don't even realize that Lyme disease is an infection. People think, you know, it can be dismissed. And what really gets to me, and I know it got to Dr. Stephen Phillips in his book, Chronic, he wrote about it, is this concept of like PTLDS, post-treatment Lyme disease. It's couched as being an autoimmune condition only if, you know, let's say you've had 21 days of doxy. Days zero to 21, I think this is how we put it, or it could have been zero to 28, depending on the treatment regimen, you have an infection, right? At day 22 or day 29, now you have an autoimmune disease. We, we know that there's ample evidence that suggests, yes, immune dysfunction. Yep, absolutely. But there's also this infectious piece, the chronic infectious piece, which is appreciated for things like HIV, for things like uh, tuberculosis, you know, mycobacterium non-tuberculous mycobacterium, all kinds of agents, but the ones like Borrelia, it's like, it's, it's a past infection. Okay. So, so you reject, you reject the, uh, the chronic versus acute definition of Lyme disease, meaning you do not accept that Lyme disease is a, is a an acute disease. You believe it's a chronic infectious disease. Well, there are people that recover, right? So if you're treated promptly, um, you know, if you happen to be someone who is fortunate enough to have access to care and you have like the classic erythema migraines rash, you have a bullseye. I didn't get that lucky, you know, so right. I was like, so, a whole year. So so what, what does that mean from a definitional standpoint? Because um, if it's. I, I think, again, the challenge is that we have so many different definitions, including, by the way, Dr. Phillips' definition. You know, he he even has a different name. He calls it Lyme Plus, right? Um, sure. In his book, Chronic, right? I so, like that, by the yeah. way. So yeah. what, here's what you're calling, what you're, you know, calling attention to is, I'm going to go back again to my mentor, Chuck Stratton. He wrote a paper where he referred to multiple sclerosis as a syndrome, uh, which includes infectious agents as drivers. So what you're zeroing in on is a fact with all these th diseases. Our focus is to look at dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And this, this researchy term heterogeneity means it's different for different people. And it has not only to do with your microbes that are on board, uh, both good and bad. It also has to do with your immune system and your unique genetic setup, and also probably environmental factors too, like exposure to certain toxins. So the complexity I don't know that we should really rush to wrap a definition around it. Humans love a silo. We love ourselves to specialize. We love to have something in a pretty little box. And I don't think this is one of those. But things. We, we need a definition, right? Because there yeah. are, there are, there are Lyme deniers. And part of the reason why I argue there are Lyme deniers is because we can't settle on a definition and because we can't settle on a definition and we have folks arguing like you are right now, that it presents differently in different people based on a number of different um, you know, 
factors, uh, I, I think puts us in a position where we're at a disadvantage. And and we here at the- so may, I, may I address what you're saying? Because I feel the same way as you, very passionately about it. So I'm going to give you another example from medicine. So take the, um, and I'm sure you guys have talked about it at nauseum on the podcast, but Dr. Barry Marshall, no, <clears throat> excuse me, Nobel laureate, who is credited with unveiling the fact that H. pylori, this little bacterium in your stomach and intestinal tract is actually causing ulcers. We now know that it can also cause cancers and that's being explored more deeply. It's also been found as a possible uh, etiologic agent for Alzheimer's disease. Doesn't just hang out in your gut. Um, you know, not everyone who has helicobacter pylori presents with an ulcer or gastritis. Some people are asymptomatic. Not everyone who gets it gets cancer, but some people absolutely do. Um, there's a great deal of heterogeneity, but it's an infectious disease. So I put, I put Lyme in the same category. It's an infectious disease. Um, it doesn't mean that if someone has it and they're tolerating it, they shouldn't be treated, you know, because of especially certain organisms have a relationship with our cells, you know, where they can actually result in or set up environments where you can, we can develop dysfunction. And I'm not sure it's worth rolling the dice. So for the example of helicobacter, somewhere around 30% of the global population is just walking around with it, but they're going to transmit it to people who are vulnerable, right? Okay. They're going, you know, they're, they're potentially, as they age and immune function wanes and their gut microbiome changes, they may potentially develop a gastric cancer because of it, colorectal cancer. So I put it in the same category and I prefer, you know, to be quite specific about it and refer to it as an infectious disease, which is what Lyme is. Lyme is okay. An so let me, let me give you a, let me give you our definition, and I'd like you to react to it. Please. Uh, we define Lyme disease as a polymicrobial, multisystemic, chronic infectious disease. Give me your okay. reaction to that definition. Perfect and beautiful. You're honing in on the host response. You're capturing the heterogeneity. Um, you're capturing the polymicrobial nature. You know, this is why, you know, I'll, I'll pull a page out of our, our side of things, which is to really examine closely the possible infectious drivers of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. There have been drug trials that have been done, but we advocate for precision because and, and almost no doctor knows it better than a Lyme literate doctor. You have to figure out what is going on. You cannot just throw, you know, minocycline at 4,000 people and see what sticks. And, and that, by the way, didn't work. You know, there was not, not quite 4,000, but several hundred patients were given minocycline uh, that had early Alzheimer's disease in England, and it did not impact the trajectory at all. So, but then our group identified case reports of reversible dementias of all different types of dementia, including Alzheimer's. And some of those case reports were caused by neurologic Lyme, neuroborreliosis. And the patients, even if their memory scores were horrible, 30 is the best. Let's say they were like a 20. Some of these patients actually, after many years of having their diagnosis of Alzheimer's, got IV antibiotics and got better and got back to like a normal memory score. So, you know, these cases tell us that they demand precision and they demand we need better drugs too. We need more precise medicines. Yes. So, so let's now, let's revisit your journey, right? Because as you were sharing your journey with us, um, you were, you were, in, at least in my mind, a, a, um, I think a perfect presentation of our definition of Lyme disease. And by the way, we get pushback from folks, um, on this, on this definition, uh, because, um, what's, what's Rich, happening? You got yelled at last week about this. Come on. Yeah, and every, you get slapped and, around all the time. <laughs> so, well, I rarely get slapped around, but we sometimes have some uh, uh, exciting debate about it, right? And um, and uh, you were you were someone uh, who was likely bitten by ticks during the course of her life. Your immune system was was harboring um, you know a diverse set of germs. And then at some point, it was either another tick bite where many microbes are spit into you, uh, and it wasn't engorged ticks. It was it was feeding on you for a long time. And again, it's not the feeding part of it, which sounds really gross because they're sucking our blood, but it's yeah. actually all the germs that are being spit in, spit into us 
of which we we know that it could be as many as 200, but we only have 19 of those um, of those germs identified. And then your immune system became overwhelmed. And when your immune system became overwhelmed, what was happening was you were testing for something that may or may not have been a part of the tick bite experience, but it was certainly something that made it so that your immune system um, had uh, had had lost homeostasis and you were now your body was now being uh was being damaged as a result of some microbes that your immune system had been managing before yeah I, and i spent a lot of time thinking about that too you know the possibility of there having been a tipping point um uh, because i believe that is likely to be the case and you know there were you know, different factors that probably came into play. Like I also wonder for women about childbearing, you know, where you're really taxed and I, you know, um, breastfed each of my children for two years apiece. They were both premature and had a lot of needs, um, you know, NICU babies. So, you know, the stress and strain on your body, just the changes that you undergo. So that's all things that like, I have a deep scientific curiosity about that if I'm being a scientist, which is what I am, I'll acknowledge that there are a lot of unknowns about a case like mine, right? So we find what we look for, right? With blood work and you can identify this, that, or the other, but what the medical community always comes back and says is Nikki, you know, you don't really know for sure if the microbes that you detected in that blood work are what was driving your disease because some people that are perfectly well have those microbes on board. Um, and it gets back to, you know, Koch's postulates, right? Which is, the methodology in science that we use to determine whether there's a causal relationship, cause and effect, right? So, um, you know, what I do know about my case is that I would like to understand it better. And I would like to understand people like all of us better because I did get better from broad spectrum antibiotic therapy for a very prolonged period of time. And what I acknowledge is that the drugs that I was given also have some other powerful effects that go beyond killing germs. Some drugs um, like azithromycin, for example, they have very potent anti-inflammatory activities, and those are regarded as important in some of the diseases, you know, like asthma, for example. Um, now, one thing that I go back to is how do we answer those questions, right? And the way we answer those questions is by understanding the system as a whole and bridging the silos. And so that is why essentially with my research team, we have an interdisciplinary group of people asking these questions. What, what is happening in the host, the, the, the person that's unique? You know, what's happening with the pathobiome, which is your collection of germs that are contributing to disease in conjunction with the immune system. And then what happens when you take away some of those things? Like, does it take away the inflammation or the uh, byproduct of the infection? And does it also get rid of the infection? And because that's really, I think, one of the only ways to answer that question about causality. You know, I call it the C, the C word, you know, like what causes a disease is, is always a big question. And it's a really tough scientific question. Yeah, so like, one of the things that was causing me to wince as you were sharing, you know, your journey was you you had what we typically see here during during interviews where we have doctors identifying symptoms or patients identifying symptoms for their doctors. Doctors either saying they're idiopathic, they just can't find any reason for these symptoms, yeah. or we have doctors denying that you even have these symptoms and suggest that it's all in your head. Um, yeah, and I had one of those it, along the way. Uh, I'm sure you he did, offered, right? So, he offered me Xanax, and uh, he got a spicy reply. Well, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure he did, right? But, but you know, like w one of the things that I'm wondering, just from from the standpoint from the patient's perspective, is is it worse to be told that it's all in your head and that there's really nothing wrong with you and being gassed with that way, or is it worse to have a doctor acknowledge that you have symptomology but tell you that it's that it's idiopathic and that, that they that there is no way of defining what it what, what it is. I mean, let, let, first help me with that. Which of those bad. two experiences were worse for you? They were equally as bad. Um, and they equally deprived me of hope. And they made me feel that I didn't have a teammate or an advocate, which is what I would tell to anyone watching this is, you know your body. And 
there is something to be truly said for, you know, uh, I'm not discrediting the number of years that go into a medical education or the experience that it takes to, uh, you know, navigate those situations with patients where a doctor is trying to like separate emotion and also try to really tease out a story that that takes a tremendous amount of skill and pressure. But what I will say is that, you know, one of the more memorable experiences I had along my journey was actually my one of my two pulmonologists who, in looking at me, looking at my oxygen saturation, looking at the weight, weight loss, he was really concerned about me. He said, I'm probably going to have to bronch you soon, you know, use a bronchoscope and get a little piece of lung tissue. I don't know what the heck is going on. He said he was, he was also around my age with, with some kids. And he said, you know, he had tears in his eyes and he was like, I'm going to pray for you. And I need to step out because I'm going to go to my computer and I need to think for a few minutes while you're here. And I need to look something up. I have an idea, but can I, can I leave you here for a minute? And honestly, that was so meaningful to me that he was willing to be so humble and say, you know what? this is like really a problem. And I'm looking at this person and she's here and trusting me with her care. And, you know, a 15 minute appointment slot for a chronic illness patient is never going to be enough. No, so it's, it not. it's not. He came back in the room and this is when I was just, my main complaint was my lungs and before my bladder thing even happened. And he said, you know, you might have helicobacter because there can be this thing where it causes a reflux and then it can mess with respiratory tone. So he started thinking infection and he was barking up the right tree, but in the wrong neighborhood, you know, it was like, it was like the right idea. So then after that, he sent me for the breath test for H. pylori. I didn't have H. pylori, but his simple act of like treating me like a person, like a friend would and saying, you know, getting sad with me and being like, wow, this is, this really sucks. Like, this is horrible. And wow, you've got these two little boys and let me step out. Like I need a minute. I'm going to, I need to look something up. So there's that, you know, being told that something's idiopathic, what, it, what I came to realize after meeting my mentor, Chuck, was that a lot of the patients that Chuck ended up treating were actually doctors. So they would get a terrible diagnosis like rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, the bladder pain disorder or a chronic respiratory disease or MS. And then they would stop for a second and think about what their doctor was telling them. And now that they had skin in the game, they wanted to know what is driving chronic autoimmunity? What is driving inflammation? And you know, it's funny, I present this when I do, you know, when I, when I give a talk, I pull up a screenshot of, if you just look up inflammation on the National Library of Medicine, PubMed, the number one thing that comes up in inflammation's description is infection. The first thing. So how many diseases are chronic, idiopathic, and inflammatory and we haven't even ruled out the number one thing on the list. Infection. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, you know, we look. We know the three eyes of Lyme disease, which is infection, uh, inflammation, and immune dysfunction, right? And you had all three. You know, and, and so you know, part of what's making me anxious was making me anxious as you're as you're outlining your symptoms. Is look, Lyme was Lyme was in my head, you know, immediately, right? Uh, and you know, we we often hear uh, you know hear Lyme des Lyme described as the um, as a supermarket um, diagnostic disease because more people are diagnosed in the supermarket than they are in doctors' offices because those of us who have been on the journey know what the know what it looks like and you sounded like Lyme very early to me and and then as soon as you started to describe being treated with steroids i was wincing right because we know there we know that when steroids are brought into um an infectious environment they're immunosuppressive but in many cases the the infection is going to take off right so you you had what looked like very typical um lyme symptoms with all due respect to all of your doctors and they were not they, a they were they were they were not even thinking Lyme, rather than uh, especially when they when they when you had the um, idiopathic um, challenge they, they were thinking Lyme when they were having this polymicrobial um, you know concern uh, and then they were treating you with diseases that in, I mean with with treatments that in many cases um, were going to be immuno suppressive and it did not surprise me as you were describing your your illness uh progressing that it was getting worse and worse and then what happens when you finally get treated for it, the infection now all of a sudden your breathing issues are resolved right um yeah. and and, we, and and it's clear that this was an you know an infectious cause and um so 
So yeah, so today I, I don't have neurodegenerative symptoms. I would call myself like 95% healthy because I'm not the same as I was before all this happened. You know, I was an avid runner and my doctor had suggested, you know, to take on like a moderate lifestyle. So I exercise, I eat really healthy. I try to minimize anything that would be bad. You know, that's common sense, um, like sugars and, you know, just sleep and take care of myself. Like if I burn the candle at both ends with work or the times when I've actually contracted COVID very hard for me to recover very hard. So like I consider myself though, to be so fortunate for, for being well today. And that's why, you know, when I got through some of the treatment and was feeling so much better, I went back to Chuck, Dr. Stratton, and I said, how can I help? And that's when I started thinking about bringing people together. Because in these little groups, you know, like all over the world doing research all separate, we're like little voices, little fires that can easily be put out. But together we have such more, you know, we have a voice, you know, we're we strong. Do. And, and, and we want to get there, Nick, but, but I, I, want to, I want to bring Matt in because poor Matt has not been able to ask any of his millions of questions yeah. because you you're and I are- You're talking too much uh, tonight, Rich. You're killing me here. I'm just saying. You, you, and, you and I are, are, are grooving a little too much for Matt. So so Matt, come in and ask Nikki Sorry, some Matt. of the millions of questions. <laughs> yeah, I've had so many. So I just want to clarify because I love the term pathobiome and we're going to get to why that's part of, you know, the name of an organization you've created and an initiative you've created. But can you talk to us about the term pathobiome and why you've said it so many times throughout this podcast and how it relates to the thing we hear often, the one drug for one disease model we've heard from other people? Yeah. So the definition of pathobiome, like if you look it up, you'll see multiple definitions. Um, the one that I like includes the host response. So like your microbiome is your passengers, right? And we now know that there's a microbiome, like our whole body is essentially a community where other groups are hanging out. The pathobiome refers to when the community becomes deleterious with the host. You know, in other words, and sometimes I call I call the Lyme plus story like Dr. Phillips refers to it as or this polymicrobial infection. I call it organized crime. Thank you. Yeah. So so organized crime, I think, is a good example. It's like you got a bunch of bad guys, you know, and they may even help each other. Evidence suggests that there are activities that, you know, certain organisms engage in, like swapping DNA and protecting one another in biofilms and you know, having these um, deleterious effects that can lead to various chronic diseases. And that really is the essence of the pathobiome is it's the, yes, it's the relationship of your, your community of organisms that can become bad, right? That can go toward, um, you know, being more heavily weighted in pro-inflammatory organisms, right? And maybe fewer of the good organisms uh, because we know they exist as well from a lot of the gut microbiome research and more toward a state where then your body is reacting to it. So the pathobiome is um, is sort of like looking at the side of the microbiome where the germs can become deleterious for the person that they're inhabiting. Right. So I look at it, though, where the pathobiome is a huge reason why some people get sick with Lyme and some people don't. And I know there's deeper reasons, but we're all born with a microbiome. And part of that is we're born from our, you know, the, the, the microbiome from our parents. So we pick up microbes when we come out at childbirth and all of these things make up our immune system essentially, right? The microbiome is, is connected to our gut health, is connected to, to our immune health. And I think as we acquire microbes throughout our lives, we're constantly coming into contact with microbes, whether it's viruses, bacteria, parasites, those things assimilate to our microbiome we were born with and if they get out of balance, that's when we're more inclined to become sick in combination with our genetics, as you touched on earlier. Yeah. So the pathobiome initiative, and we're getting into now how you form this Alzheimer's pathobiome initiative, I really think is referring to how these microbes, some good, some bad, and how they're interacting in our bodies can result in certain neurodegenerative diseases like neurological Lyme or, and neurological Lyme has different components. We learned on, the, on our last podcast with Dr. Morales and different, different ways it presents and different ultimate root causes, whether it's the bacteria in the brain or damage from the bacteria in the brain, or simply opening up the blood brain barrier and allowing okay. our dumb or our innate immune system to send an immune response to our brain causing neuroencephalitis, right? So we, there's a lot of moving parts here, but can you kind of fold this into your research, your studies and how you form the Alzheimer's pathobiome initiative? And also how Borrelia, you know, is, is a part of this. Sure. So um, 
my sort of answer to the question that keeps me up at night, which is like, how do I turn my bad experience into something that makes sure other people don't have to suffer was sort of to bring people together. I'm a, I'm a collaborator. I'm a bridge builder. I love science. I understand it. I read really tangentially, which I'll never stop doing. I love to read about veterinary medicine because we can learn so much from vets and about how we, you know, diagnose and treat and even identify um, root causes of disease in animals can be very helpful. We decided, you know, as a group, me and my consortium of researchers that focus on microbial infections and disease to really zero in, you know, we could focus on a lot of things. In fact, when I started my um, organization, Intracell Research Group, we sort of were thinking of cardiovascular disease and arthritis and asthma and also, you know, brain diseases like MS and Alzheimer's. But then it became clear to me that, you know, we needed to really focus. So we zeroed in on Alzheimer's disease because there was a great deal of evidence, credible evidence, suggesting that infections are a prominent driver for a subset of patients. We also focused on asthma um, because, you know, in part, of course, my own experience with being able to have remission but also that I wasn't alone and other patients that were able to achieve prolonged remission clearly had, um, you know, it kind of went against the idea that the macrolide antibiotic was an anti-inflammatory because if you were really interrupting an inflammation pathway only, when you took away the drug, the patient would relapse. But if you were killing germs or you impacted something in a more permanent fashion that was actually driving the inflammation, you know, so, so we zeroed in on these topics. Our Alzheimer's Pathobiome Initiative is the result of me thinking about bringing together a truly like hodgepodge group, if you will. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. So what I've noticed in a lot of ways throughout my life, both in my professional career, my personal life, and then my own medical journey is how, how we really love to silo things and how silos can really prevent us from seeing the bigger picture and especially in chronic diseases. So with our group, we have people that are expert in the immune system and immunology, um, infectious diseases, microbiology, um, traditional neurodegeneration researchers, you know, that are looking at, um, you know, traditional Alzheimer's research and literally bringing together the different germ groups. So there have been groups that study, you know, Lyme disease. There are groups that study herpes viruses, groups that study fungal infections, groups that study Toxoplasma gondii and other parasites, um, groups that have focused on polymicrobial issues. Like literally guys, I could, it, it runs the gamut. And I thought separately, they're all really easy to ignore, aren't they? They've been publishing for like three decades, my goodness. But together, you know, as one voice, talking about the pathobiome, about the chronic infection story. But more than just the voice, we also are, we pressure tested one another and wrote a paper that we published in June in Alzheimer's and Dementia, which is a research roadmap. So effectively, we took all of these bright minds and literally sat down and said, okay, what are the issues? And the first thing we really, really zeroed in on is something that the Lyme community is super aware of, is the testing is a problem. So diagnosing an infection, you know, in a patient, right? And being able to say that the infection is active, not just we're looking for the immune response, that the infection was present. And being able to do so without missing stealth microbes, things that are hard to detect, like Lyme, for example, and other um, stealth organisms. So our group is really centered around a diagnostic approach that can be utilized in patients at the first signs of cognitive decline. And, you know, with this approach that we are working actively to devise, so we're, we're generating preliminary data, and this is a multi-centered global collaboration. So different labs are doing dis different aspects of our project. We, um, we really aim to impact something larger than just dementia, because you could literally take the testing that we devise and all that we learn about identifying microbes in living patients without having to have super invasive tests done could be applied to MS, to ALS, you know, to um, psychiatric diseases like schizophrenia, to PANS and PANDAS, the pediatric syndromes that, you know, afflict children. Um, literally, the value is, is really kind of hard to capture. So, so that really is the essence of, of our pathobiome initiative. And then beyond the developing a consensus testing approach or a panel approach, the final stage of our project is really to test it in living patients. So 
what we propose is that once we have a reliable test that can identify the majority of microbes on board in patients where there's evidence of infection, whether it's one bug or polymicrobial, that we would treat them in a targeted manner, very much in the same way patients that we identified in case reports of reversible dementia got treated and see if the patients can have either, um, you know, a uh, remitting of their symptoms, so improvement of memory, or even stopping progression. So, so that's kind of kind of what our group has been working on of late. So just a few comments there that that PubMed study that you mentioned you you dropped in June as a collaborative effort with leaders in various communities is really powerful. And we want all of our listeners to go check it out and read it and digest it. So I'm just going to share the title for keywords here for searching, and we'll drop a link into the show notes as well. But the title of that was Establishment of a Consensus Protocol to Explore the Brain Pathobiome in Patients with Mild Cognitive Impairment and Alzheimer's Disease, Research Outline and Call for Collaboration. And in fact, one of the co-authors was... Uh, Dr. Edward Breitschwert, who's been on the podcast as well. He's been on, he was on episode, I think, 366 of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. So the best analogy I can think of to describe what you're doing, and first of all, it's the first time we've heard of somebody doing it at this level and this magnitude. So thank you for doing this, because we haven't heard of anybody doing anything like this, which is so desperately needed. But we often criticize medical professionals for saying, hey, you're a neurologist. So if I come see you and I have neurological one, you're going to say I have a seizure disorder. You're a cardiologist. You're going to say I have heart block. All of these things are related to Lyme disease, but they're seeing what they want to see in their specialty. Then you take it up a level. We're in the Lyme community, and I'm guilty of this, right? And so I'm going to kind of criticize myself here. I see certain symptoms of maybe a neurodegenerative symptom, neurological Lyme, cognitive impairment, brain fog. And I go, you have Lyme disease. You should get tested for Lyme. But it's far more than just Lyme. Lyme is one of many pathogens which contribute to neurodegenerative diseases. And that's the truth. And that's where you're bringing to light to saying, hey, ultimately, we want to get people better and we want to help people heal if they can. And if we identify the complete bucket of pathogens which contribute to or lead to these brain impairments, we're going to help create better tests, identify what you have, and ultimately have targeted treatments to get you relief from your symptoms, right? Is that, is that a good way of describing what it you're really doing here? Is. It absolutely is. And and Matt, one thing that you said too, that I want to share with you that I'm equally as passionate about is I know not everyone can navigate the medical literature and that's not fair. So I also wrote an op-ed piece that mirrors that call for consensus. And that was published by a great outlet um, by my friend, Deborah Khan, who created something called Being Patient Alzheimer's. And it's a resource for patients and their families, as well as it's become a resource for researchers where, um, you know, where I basically wrote um, a piece, you know, about how Alzheimer's and certain dementias can be infections and why doctors should really be thinking about it so that people could understand why do we, why is this global team coming together? We're coming together because the weight of the evidence is so heavy that it can't and shouldn't be ignored anymore. So, right. Yeah. And I just want to touch on, I mean, look, we've had some other leaders in the community share what you're saying. And I love that you're saying it's not just Alzheimer's, it's dementia, it's ALS, it's psychological conditions. And we have Dr. Leo Shea III from New York City, who is a Lyme literate psychiatrist, who is a member of ILADS, come on and say, what's that? Psychologist. Oh, psychologist, thank you. So he, he came on and said that he believes every mental health condition has an underlying pathogenic root cause. And that's kind of what you're saying, right? So he's doing yeah. it in the mental health world and he's a member of ILADS contributing with other, other people. And, you know, we've had, I mean, if I go back and look at every guest we've had on this podcast, I can't tell you how many of them were misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis, ALS, Alzheimer's, dementia, you name it. I mean, all these things that you're now finding have an underlying, you know, pathogen root cause, Never mind are they, are they misdiagnosis, but they're also being driven by the bacteria, which is causing the real root cause right. of that, right? Yeah, so so this is interesting. So one thing that, you know, could come up in any community is, oh, well, if you have, um, you know, amyloid plaques, right, on a scan, and you have an Alzheimer's diagnosis, but then you get better from treatment for neuroborreliosis or for cryptococcus neoformans, which is a fungal infection, then you didn't have Alzheimer in the first place, you had a different disease. Now, me, I really don't care to, to argue with the community. I don't care about that. I just want to know who are the patients that are walking around right now with a treatable infection. And yes. that is what was eerie to me. So Matt, like with this paper that I co co-led um, with my colleague, brilliant colleague, Dr. Richard Lay at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, 
I was under my purview was to literally scour the medical literature for these cases where people had an infection was the driver of their dementia. And mind you, for the audience, dementia is the umbrella. Alzheimer's is under the umbrella. And then there are other forms of dementia, like frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, uh, Parkinsonism, uh, et cetera. So Alzheimer's dementia is the most common form of dementia. The thing that we found was so startling with these case reports, and they weren't, they were plentiful, and I'm sure I missed some just based on how vast the world of PubMed is. I tried to use as many search terms and query terms as I could, but the thing that was crazy was these case reports written by these authors. The conclusion was the same nearly every time, regardless of what they found, which was infections should be on the radar for the clinician in patients with new onset cognitive impairment. So it was like th these case reports are a call to their fellow clinicians to say, dude, think about infection. Like it's, it's a possibility it could be there. So we know like syphilis, the sexually transmitted disease, can cause um, you know, a neurologic infection and cause syphilitic dementia. And one thing that's really striking is I'm gonna reference Dr. Judith McClossey's work, brilliant Lyme uh, researcher and neuropathologist who spoke at an event and said, literally you cannot, from a neuropathological standpoint, when you examine a brain after someone passes away, you cannot distinguish an Alzheimer brain from a neuroborreliosis brain. Or, or a uh, neurologic uh, syphilis brain. So to me, you know, whether something gets a label of Alzheimer's disease or in the future, our group demonstrates something that they want to rename entirely called infectious dementia, I don't care. I just want to know who these patients are and who we can help. Because as of right now, honestly, Matt, no one's even testing. So you, you'd only get tested if you got lucky. If you had a doctor that said, you know, they were curious for one reason or the other. But let's talk about that because, you know, I'll focus on just the Borrelia or the Lyme trigger for dementia and cognitive decline diseases. I can tell you, I saw countless neurologists and most people on this podcast have seen many neurologists and it's almost, it's, it's super rare. If I have to say, I can't even remember one patient story of almost 500 podcast interviews where somebody has said to us, my neurologist diagnosed me because my symptoms were indicative of Lyme. Never mind, my neurologist said, hey, I'm having neurological symptoms, but there can be an underlying pathogen root cause we should investigate and test for Lyme or some other disease. And that's really startling to think that doctors aren't even thinking to test for pathogenic root causes to neurological diseases, right? I mean, that's that's the part that's really frustrating on my end. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's super frustrating for me too. Um, and you're absolutely right. So it's we're the article that I wrote, which is more digestible to the general public than our medical publication, um, the one that I was referencing before, also gets into this. So what, what I suggest, which again, might sound controversial, but I don't think it is. I think it's actually um, in line with doing no harm, is think about it in the differential diagnosis. So somebody comes in, you know, asking questions, you know, uh, are you a cat owner? Do you have, you know, pets? Do you work on a farm? Do you hike? You know, tell me a little bit about your life. Get a little bit of background history you know, can go a long way in terms of zeroing in on things to look for. But Matt, as you said, so it's like, it's bigger than the vector-borne issues. So we have something like Epstein-Barr virus, yeah. where in the last few years, it's become very clear that, and, and even they use the C word now, the causation word, that EBV is likely a causal agent in multiple sclerosis, because the research that has uh, been conducted has been incredibly compelling. You know, this military database study uh, that was published out of Harvard effectively pointed out that, you know, individuals in this military database, if they didn't get EBV, they didn't get multiple sclerosis. And the strength of the association was unbelievably powerful, and it was a very large data set. So we have, you know, issues like when you mentioned before um, the polymicrobial piece. So let's say somebody has, you know, Epstein-Barr virus on board, and they're not like tipping on the side of, you know, chronic inflammation or illness as yet, but then they encounter, you know, Borrelia burgdorferi from a tick bite or Bartonella or, you know, some other infectious agent that they get or even COVID, um, which then tips the scales into, you know, myalgic encephalopathy or chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, one of these terrible syndromes that, um, 
but it's these debilitating long-term chronic illnesses. And I think the hard thing is a lot of what you're referring to, Lyme included and others, right? Like Epstein-Barr virus are their low grade infections. And what I mean by that is that many people have them and they're healthy and they have a strong immune system and they can live asymptomatic life, lifestyles until something happens down the road, they get older, they're immune compromised, whatever it may be. So to think that something like Lyme or EBV can result in MS sounds so wild when so many people are walking around with EBV and Lyme and are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms that get treated pretty quickly without any issues, right? So I think we need to make make that clear. And I think COVID did a really good job for that because some people had COVID got over pretty quickly. Some people got COVID and had long COVID and suffered greatly. And I think that highlighted this sort of opposite effect of some people getting over a disease quickly and some people becoming chronically ill and debilitated because of it. So do you think that's a contributing factor as to why people are are having a hard time processing that these minor things can re can result in such strong debilitating neurological conditions? I think we need to normalize the fact that this is really indeed the essence of a lot of infectious diseases, even ones that can cause horrible stuff. So the number of people that are walking around with, you know, mycobacterium, you know, tuberculosis, you can have it and not have like meningitis. You know what I mean? So it's, um, it, it's really a, uh, you know, and even people can be harboring methicillin resistant staph aureus, MRSA, but they're, and they're colonized with it because they're hospital workers, it's living in their nasal cavity, but they don't have abscesses and sores and they're not dying from it. But arguably, of course, a lot of people are dying from it. So it's the same paradigm over and over. It's like the ulcers example too. So we need to kind of come away from, you know, which is why there are modified Koch's postulates. Um, the infectious diseases kind of, as we learned about them microbiologically, we realized that our own postulates were outdated. You know, like that in every case of a disease uh, that the microbe may not always produce the same disease. And, uh, you know, that there are many cases in which the, the infection is clinically not apparent. And uh, even in that case could be considered a colonization. So I think um, we have ample examples, but it's about arming patients to have that language and know okay, we know about, and doctor, we know about infections that are stealth, that people can have that they're not sick from them doesn't mean that I'm not sick from this. You know, it's a separating the two ideas. Yeah. So the other part of this is if you can just give us some data, right? So when it comes to directly correlating these pathogens, and I'll focus on mine because that's what our podcast is about. And we have, I can cite some examples, you know, between Dr. Alan McDonald, between Dr. Ava Shapi, They've done comprehensive studies. You know, Ava Shapi talked about specifically most recently Lyme and breast cancer, but we'll focus on Dr. Alan McDonald, who's partnered yeah. with Ava Shapi and saying that they are, you know, evaluating these, these patients that have neurodegenerative diseases and in all the brains they've autopsied, they found Borrelia in all of them, right? So they're not only, they're not only, they're not only uh, making these assumptions, they're finding that when they're looking at dementia patient brains post-mortem, the bacteria is there and they're, and they're citing that this is a constant and a consistent finding they're having. So can you give us some more examples like that that prove not only Lyme, but other pathogens are in the brains or in the bodies of people that are suffering from various dementia-like conditions? Yeah, so I'll tell you about like the state of the research basically with germs, including Lyme and um, neurodegeneration. So the scientific community has tried to address this issue of causality a variety of ways, as you just mentioned. There are post-mortem studies, meaning after someone passes away, they donate their brain and other tissues. Scientists examine those and identify different germs using a lot of different techniques, and a lot of different germs have been identified. Many of them I mentioned today, um, including Borrelia, Lyme. Um, now, other spirochetes, so Lyme's a spirochete, right? You can get them in your mouth, too, um, from, and they can cause periodontal disease. So you can also have those types of spirochetes in, in uh, brain tissue. But seeing it in brain tissue of sick people and comparing it to people that didn't have that disease when they died has kind of been the gold standard. Um, and that has been done and it has been demonstrated that there's a disproportionate amount of deleterious microbes across the board in the diseased brains. But how do you know, just to play devil's advocate, that they didn't show up because the disease showed up, right? So then um, scientists have taken another tack because we can't do experiments like this on a person, they're not done, animal models have been done. So um, animals have been infected with organisms that have been found in 
for brains of patients that are deceased, uh, mostly mouse models. Um, and the mice have demonstrated Alzheimer's like pathology. So this has been done with um, an interesting methodology. So the nose to brain is a route of entry that is quite um, important because microbes can exploit that juncture. There's actually an area that's kind of deficient in the brain's protective layer, the blood brain barrier. Um, so, and due to the proximity of uh, the entorhinal cortex, which is like the, the top of the nose brain interface, um, this is, has been an area that has been, you know, strongly suspected of possibly being a problem. So scientists took a respiratory bacterium that I was talking about earlier, chlamydia pneumoniae, and actually injected it up the noses of mice and then did so in a manner of like certain number of the organism and then larger numbers for some of the mice and a really large number. And in a load dependent fashion, like in other words, the more of the germs they got, they developed, um, more severe, more severe evidence of Alzheimer's like pathology, demonstrating that germs can indeed travel from the nose to the brain in the animal model and induce pathology like you'd see in a human. But then on let's play devil's advocate, that's not a person, right? So it's not completely applicable. So then there are other types of research that have been done, like epidemiology, looking at big, big data sets over a course of time you know, looking at health records, for example, and these health record um, perusals, if you will, on really large databases like FinGen, the UK Biobank, et cetera, have revealed that getting infections in general, whether they're bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonias, meningitis, encephalitis, um, increases statistically significantly your odds of developing Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so there's that, um, you know, and then the examination of the pathology. So with, with looking at brains of people who passed away, what exactly is an amyloid plaque, right? So science has really gone about the business of characterizing these plaques because also we've tried to remove them thinking, oh boy, these are the plaques. These are what's causing the disease. Well, one of the most brilliant scientists that I ever talked with who looked at infectious drivers of MS along with my mentor, Dr. Chuck Stratton, um, and his name is Dr. David Weldon in the UK. He said it's equivalent to when you, when you target like the amyloid, it's equivalent to taking, uh, you know, silencing the guard dogs while the thieves are making away with the silver, you know, so it's sort of like disarming the immune response. So this, this research that has been done, um, Rich, uh, um, sorry, Matt, to address like your, the, fourth part of your question. So animal work, looking at postmortem brain tissues, looking at large epidemiological studies on infection. The fourth part is looking at the pathology itself. So like what is the biological response and what else can it do? Work that came out of Harvard led by Dr. Robert Moyer and also Dr. Rudy Tanzi um, and his team demonstrated that amyloid beta could in fact eradicate certain microbes or entrap them. So this evidence was really the first of its kind to point out a plausible biological mechanism by which this thing is showing up in the brain. Um, Can you explain what, that? I'm sorry. I just want to make sure we fully understand what you just sure. said. I think it's an important piece to understand. Yeah. So, so the, the, the pathology, you know, the amyloid beta plaques have been characterized as what um, the Harvard team referred to as an antimicrobial peptide. So another, or, or a trap, if you will, you know, if you hear Dr. Dr. Tanzi speak about it. And essentially the, their hypothesis is that the, and based on the research that they've done is that this is actually the body's immune response to an infection. Right. And actually um, there are researchers exploring another hallmark pathological feature of Alzheimer's disease called tau, uh, tau entangles and, and those, in certain research studies also appear to be immune responses and can be inducible by infectious agents. And maybe I'm not fully understanding. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of summarize in my own way to see if, if this makes sense or not. But I think a lot of people think of these plaques as being more of a root cause. These amyloid plaques are the root cause for dementia. But what you're saying is they're actually a potential immune response to capture the pathogens to help us respond to the foreign objects and and we're misinterpreting really what the root cause is it's not the plaque it's the infection correct 
That's what, that's what we believe deserves to be clarified. Yeah, absolutely. And that is something that is um, a major part of the research, you know, is, is like, why, you know, we had a symposium in 2021 entitled before amyloid beta with all kinds of talks, considering, you know, the pre pathology events that could occur that leads to that, that feature, because the thing that the field doesn't really talk that much about is we know that some people are loaded with pathology. Like if we scanned somebody who is cognitively intact, they may have pathology, but they may not have symptoms of the disease. So, you know, there are, there are things that beg to be clarified. And we, we just think that that's, that's one of the things that deserves attention. So the strength of the evidence at this point is quite high. Um, the amount of attention it's getting has really greatly increased. And we're so thankful for that because really the big issue that we face, as you guys know, is research funding. You know, it's, it's um, really challenging. It's a really underfunded space. For sure. I just want to posit a potential reason why patients can have the pathogen, but not the symptomology of the neurological symptoms. And, you know, we've learned that each infection and each pathogen you're referring to has different strains, right? We learned from Dr. Omar Morales from Lyme, Mexico on ILADS that I believe, and I'm going to misquote this a little bit, but there's a, uh, uh, the second part, uh, this part is correct. There was over 300 subtypes of Borrelia. And we've learned from other doctors that have been on our podcast that depending on the type of Lyme and, and which type of Lyme disease it is, where you get it and, and the makeup of it, some of them are more prone to go into the brain than others. Some are more prone to go to your joints. Some are more prone to go to your brain. And I think it really matters depending on your genetic makeup, the strength of your blood-brain barrier, and the type of pathogen or the strain of the pathogen, which dictates, is it going to end up in your brain and cause neurological decline? And it may not, even if you have the infection. I mean, that may be one scenario why that could be, I think. Well, but True. Matt, and then there's, yeah, go ahead. Do, Sorry. Don't you think there could be another piece, Nikki? Because I, I, I think what you're bringing to us that no one else has brought to us before is um is you know this whole this whole uh, discussion about the pathobiome right matt didn't yes. bring that piece in right because maybe we really are just a bag of bugs uh maybe we you know maybe the real diversity that we have is not genetic diversity because we really are not that genetically diverse we're really largely the same all of us as humans right the place where there is the most diversity is with the bugs that we're harboring and it's really when these bugs get out of balance that we ultimately find ourselves um you know developing the uh the disease pathways and 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 although Matt gave a nice outline of some of the potential uh, potential uh, challenges, maybe it's really just our you know as the bag of bugs we get out of balance. So one other thing I want to mention that I forgot to mention, which is a major pillar of evidence for the microbe hypothesis of Alzheimer's, is that the genetic predisposition piece. Um, so you guys are probably familiar with the Alzheimer's gene, as it's called, APOE4. So. It, research has also been done on that particular um, trait in relation to the infection story. And it has been observed that APOE4, you know, so fascinating. Okay, back up a little bit in human evolution. This one of the biggest determinants of our survival over thousands of thousands and thousands of years is my millions of years. Yep. Pressure, right? Right, exactly. So like selective pressure, right? The pressure from from microbes that would infect us and wipe us out, depending on where we were residing in the world, that might be different. So why is APOE4 conserved, if you will? So like, why are there still people walking around with two of these copies if it's you know such a bad thing and you're gonna have a much greater chance of developing Alzheimer's in your lifetime, um, you know, almost a guarantee by the time you get to your ripe old age and it can also strike young? Well. Work has been done demonstrating that APOE4 might be protective against certain things like malaria, but is indeed leaving us more vulnerable to other infections such as herpes viruses and chlamydia pneumonia, the organism that can travel from nose to brain. Work has been done demonstrating that people with two copies of APOE4 are also a better host to um, HIV and to certain infectious agents. So. You know what we're talk really talking about here, and Rich, I think you're you're hitting the nail on the head with your comment. Is there is a certain degree of complexity, um, particularly in the sort of organisms that we harbor, 
but then because of our relationship with the organisms over many millions of years, we could be more or less vulnerable to certain ones. And another interesting thing from research that comes out is, is sort of like people that get, people that get certain diseases may almost never get another disease. And so it's sort of like with every genetic trait, there's a flip side of the coin as to why it's still here, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense, right? Because we are adaptive beings. And as a result of being adaptive, we're going to hold on to certain traits because they served us during certain periods of, of, of our evolutionary period. And you're right, because you know, because we 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 all have come together from a diverse set of uh, of historical experiences. In some cases, we're going to have traits that are going to serve us better than other times. But in the end, we're still a bag of bugs. And if we stay in homeostasis, we're, we're, we're more likely to be healthy. And if we do not stay in homeostasis, if our immune system is not going to be able to manage you know, these, these bugs, uh, then we're going to find ourselves in a difficult place, right? Because a lot of what you're talking about, you know, we, we've we heard from Dr. Bill Rawls, right? And one of Dr. Bill Rawls' theories is the pot boiling over theory, right? And what Dr. Rawls is, yep. is essentially arguing is that the pot boils over and that's when we get sick. So it may be boiling and boiling and boiling and we're managing and managing and managing and then it boils over and now we find ourselves, we, we find ourselves in, you know, in a, in a, in a tough spot, right? Um, and, you know, I, I do think we we really need to spend a lot more time focusing on um, you know I again I, I love the you know the the, the pathobiome uh, element of of your the name of your organization because I think that's really getting to the heart of the place where we need to do more research um, and where we where we I think we're probably going to make the greatest number of gains moving forward. Um, because of the because of the um, you know the management of our of our of our you know and and I guess I guess it's not just our microbiome because we just we have we're all bugs right I mean it's really who we are and we have to make our peace with that and find find a, a way of, of 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 staying in balance and understanding how in some ways our our um, adaptive traits. Uh, will serve us, and in some ways, our adaptive traits will not serve us. And 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 identifying that that connection between our you know our uh, pathobiome and our uh, adaptive traits. Absolutely right. And then I didn't really talk about the good guys, but it's become really clear that certain organisms in our gut, you know, may be very very beneficial to us in forming some of these early immune responses from the time we're a baby. And one thing I didn't mention that I also believe I believe it deserves attention is environmental exposures. You know, some of the thing, toxins that we're consuming in the foods that we eat and how those impact microbial diversity. Um, I had the chance to hear Dr. Marty Blazer speak, who's a big gut microbiome expert up at Infectious Disease Week this past fall. And, you know, it was truly enlightening as to the, the flip side of the coin, which is, you know, um, the reduction in diversity of some important microbes that may actually help mitigate the effects of inflammation. And there really does seem to be like a gut brain access, which really brings to mind another thing, which is that the body's one whole system, right? Which is another reason we can't be so siloed, especially when it comes to these complex multi-system diseases. Again, I have one more question I want to ask you about on this topic. Dr. Rawls argued to us, there's no such thing as a good bug. Uh, no matter no matter what bug you have in you, you know they're they're all going to be com competing with you for resources, and ultimately what's going to happen is uh, is they're going to eat you when you know when you um, you know when when your immune system stops functioning, all the bugs are going to eat, which is why your body ultimately breaks down when you die. So is, is there really a distinction between a good bug and a bad bug, or is really the key just keeping keeping uh, all the bugs in balance and recognizing that um, it's really balance that's going to lead us to be healthy and a, and, and a lack of balance that's going to cause us to lose our um, health, or is there something else? Truth be told, I don't think we know the answer to that yet. You know what I mean? Um, I get what Dr. Rawls is saying. I had a coffee with him a few years ago because he lives here in my state. Yeah, and yeah. I love talking to Bill. Um, really enjoyed learning from him. You know, I think I think he makes a good point. It's kind of concordant with what my mentor, Chuck, uh, who I keep pointing to because his picture is yeah. over here. Um, what Chuck would say was, you know, he, he wasn't a big fan of um, the microbiome, you know, being so beneficial. He kind of was 
he didn't, he said the horse left the barn without enough data yet. You know, there are all these companies selling these probiotics and, you know, there have been documented GI infections and things from that are over the counter, which are not regulated by anyone, um, where you can even overpopulate and establish too large of a population of something considered to be a commensal or healthy microbe. But the research that's coming out, um, you know, on certain species um, in a certain level of abundance is really fascinating to me as a scientist and begs the question of like, okay, if we have these guys on board as part of the community, do they help keep a balance? You know, are they, because we're going to get bugs on board, right? So back to Bill's point, which is like, you know, the moment we're here, we're infused with organisms from, and even before we're here from our mother and uh, you are home to bugs and you can't be completely sterile um, because that that's, you know, there's no way to have that happen and to live a normal life. So, you know, you have to, I guess, understand the balance. And, um, but the thing that I think really remains to be answered is like, what is that balance? And it's likely not to be the same for everyone. You know, it's, it's, so that's where I think we need to do more work. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And, and, and I think it is, I think it is the place where, uh, where folks in the Lyme community need to focus, right? Uh, we, we don't really spend a lot of time uh, testing our guts. We don't spend a lot of time trying to identify you know what what uh, bugs may or may not be um, impacting um, you know our health and and you know we you've been kind enough to be with us for over two hours now so I I am going to start to wind down because I have a gazillion different you know questions I could ask you about whether or not we really have free will and whether or not we really are just um, you know responding to the bugs in our brain and 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 how they're driving us and what kind of decision making we're making you know decision making and uh, you know, I really love the conversation you and Matt were having about whether or not, um, you know, the, um, the 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 discovery of plaque and Alzheimer's is really uh, is whether one is causing the other or whether or not they just happen to be there at the same time. And this is really just a specious connection that that, um, you know, the uh, the medical community is making. So, you know, again, this is just, a, you know, a really exciting conversation. And we really loved the. Um, we love this, but our folks do have a, a limited bandwidth too. So we're at the two hour mark. So maybe we're gonna have to uh, make sure we set up a part two so we can discuss a lot of these other things that I'm that I'm you know now just rifting about. And uh I would, and let me, love that. We, we definitely need a part two. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would absolutely to happen. love that. So so Nikki, yeah. why don't you why don't you uh give our folks an outline of um you know what is going on and what the future is for for the intracellular research group. Um, what is uh, going on and what the future is for the Alzheimer's Pathobiome Initiative um, and how folks can get in touch with you if uh, they'd like to rift with you the way we have for the last two hours. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I just want to thank my amazing co-founders of the Alzheimer's Pathobiome Initiative and members of my scientific advisory board for being with me for the last six and a half years and to encourage this work, which is all mission driven. Um, I am a collaboration architect. That's the best way to describe it. But I'm supported by some incredible he people. Dr. Wilmore Webley at UMass, Dr. David Hahn, who is in Wisconsin, is our resident uh, infectious asthma expert. Um, my teammate, Dr. Brian Balin at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, whose work with chlamydia pneumoniae and Alzheimer's disease helped inform you know, some of the treatments that Dr. Stratton gave me that helped bring me back from being sick. Um, you know, uh, uh, Lavinia Alberi, my colleague in Switzerland, who's just an expert in salivary diagnostics and finding markers of disease and microbes in our saliva. Uh, Dr. Garth Ehrlich at Drexel, who's absolutely phenomenal and uh, it happens to be the president of ILADS, but also is excellent at detecting microbes and recently published incredible work about the brain pathobiome. And of course, our colleague, um, Dr. David Corey at Baylor, who's an immunologist looking at fungi in the brain, as well as in asthma. Dr. Amy Nelson at the University of South Alabama. Sorry, I got a lot of people to thank. And a oh, lot of people you. that are responsible for making all of this happen. Dr. George Perry, who is an expert in, you know, understanding oxidative stress in the context of Alzheimer's disease, as well as in the context of infections. And, uh, you know, just the gratitude that I feel for everyone. Um, one last person who I definitely wouldn't want to omit is Dr. Orsha Mesh in the neuroengineering group at the University of Pittsburgh that is doing incredible work that will help clarify some of these questions. So, you know, what I would say is, is that collaboration is the answer and that is what we're employing. So when you have really difficult problems, you need experts with a lot of different points of view because the moment we get 
too narrow, innovation goes out the window. We keep, you know, on a hamster wheel of all the same ideas in a cycle. So what we're really trying to do with this work um, with our collaborative, the Alzheimer's Pathobiome Initiative, is to start with Alzheimer's to create a test that can detect, you know, the majority of organisms in a living patient um, and then use it to find out who has these chronic infections and who can we help. And because like we discussed today, the implication of chronic infection and so many other diseases, we'll be able to reapply our testing and the methodology that we used, even our collaborative model, we want it to be copied. I want this to be something that other disease states, other universities go, oh, that's cool. You know, we should have seven to 10 universities working on this at once, why not? Um, one of the things I'll share about our effort that makes it unique is that it helps to really respect resources like patient samples. Patient samples in science represent someone's life that was lost. We are doing honor to those samples. So they're traveling. They're not just going to go to one lab for one narrow analysis. They're going to go to seven labs to be exhaustively studied because we respect that because I realize you know, and my team realizes that these, these resources are precious. So if people would like to follow our work, we are um, actively updating at www.alzpi, A-L-Z-P-I, uh, as in Alzheimer's Pathobiome Initiative, .org. And uh, I mentioned some of my amazing collaborators. Those are all of our partner centers and the people that are helping. We have others that are helping and um, serving as co-investigators and consultants. We are seeking to get major funding of an NIH grant for a period of at least five years, um, which allows us to fully execute our work. And we are definitely also actively trying to raise philanthropic funding. The funding that we raise will go directly to the universities. Um, Intracell Research Group, my organization, is not a 501c3 or a pass-through. It's a consultancy, and I'm the one you know who's the architect of the collaborations. So. Yeah, we have just this year received some philanthropic support and a, a, a uh, commitment for the next five years to support our work at a seed level, which is absolutely a gift and something I can, my appreciation, it's hard to express after so many years of work, um, but it will help us generate preliminary data. So this is something that, um, you know, our team is passionate about and that we're moving forward. And I'm so thankful to both of you for creating this podcast and for turning your lemons into lemonade, you know, for other people to learn from and to help other people like me trying to do some good to give, give us an opportunity to share our stories. So Nikki Sheltek, you are an absolute blessing. Thank you for sharing your time, your story, and your great work with the folks here at the Take Boot Camp community. I, you guys are a blessing too, and I'm so thankful for this time. And it felt like no time went by at all, even though we talked for a few hours. So, you know, Rich and Matt, you guys are just fantastic. And I look forward to having our sequel.